So first and foremost, I call this meeting to order at 8.32 a.m. And to begin, I want to just say, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, <clears throat> and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be printed, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in the progress, while in progress may do so by <coughs> calling, and I have the number here, 402-287-4615 and entering pin 188-088-723 pound. Okay, and <coughs> As Patrick said, if you do want to speak, just unmute yourself. If you are not speaking, please do try to keep yourself on mute. And pursuant to open meeting laws, because we are remote, I'm going to make sure that we take um, ro roll calls whenever we have a, a, I have a motion pending so that everybody knows who is voting which way. And finally, it seems like Patrick already did this, but just for the public record, uh, we should take attendance. And I'll just say that. You know, I can tell from that's on here that uh, myself is here, Scott Buckley, Rich McGowan is here, Chris Papavasilio is here, uh, Janine Imbriano is here, and Diana Boutwell is here as well. Um, in addition, Patrick Daly, the superintendent, and assistant superintendent Michael Connolly is here. <laughs> so with all that being said, I appreciate everybody coming here today at an emergency motion or an emergency meeting. Um, We'll start with public input as we always do. If there is one person that we're not sure, sure who that is. So if there is anybody from the public that would like to speak about something that is not already on the agenda today, uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to unmute yourself and please speak. Okay, hearing none, we're gonna move on. I assume we do not have a student report tonight, Patrick. We do not. Okay. There's no continued business. We're going to go right to the new business. So the main reason that we're here is obviously the coronavirus and, you know, the response in the public school. So um, first, I would just turn it over to Dr. Daly for an update on the coronavirus and the North Reading Public Schools reaction. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Buckley. We have been working uh, sort of nonstop with this every day. There's been uh, conferences at the state level, at all of our superintendents associations. I feel like I just want to give a thank you to um, Michael Connolly and our entire administrative team. Um, we've worked tirelessly to, I think in some ways as best as possibly be proactive to try and address some of the questions that might be coming down the road in these completely uncertain times. Um, you know, we came together as an administrative team last Wednesday, um, we, we were working on what to cancel. It seems like a, a, a thousand years ago, we were talking about, you know, are we still going to have this event versus that event versus another event? Um, Thursday, things changed dramatically as um, circumstances um, occurred in other districts and, and we needed to, to, to have sort of a, a reciprocal res response to some of those, which resulted in um, the, the difficult decision, um, which I thought was just really well executed to dismiss our middle and high school early and to um, our elementary schools were already released early. We then closed the building starting on Thursday and started a deep clean. We were able to meet with our custodians, started our deep clean. We uh, proceeded to do our deep clean through Friday. Building was closed. Um, we were thinking quite seriously at that time about continuing that. And then over the weekend, the governor extended that uh, closing of schools through April 7th. Um, which was the original date that he used, and we, we are sticking with that original date of April 7th as a, as a return date to school. Over the weekend, we communicated out quite a bit. We, we completed um, a frequently asked questions document, which answered a lot of questions. We sort of broke up the categories into some of the human resources questions, general information, uh, COVID-19 information, teaching and learning information, and then also special education, and we broke those out. And our team worked very hard to develop that document. I'm proud to say that that document has been shared statewide. You might see that in a lot of different school websites, um, a document that looks very similar to ours. And I think it helps serve as a template for a lot of folks who, um, who are working on something very similar this week. 
And so we're proud of that, and I'm proud of the work our team has done. Um, there's a lot of questions that I'm sure folks have that we may be able to address with respect to teaching and learning, with respect to um, some other some other pieces and aspects of this. And so I, I'm going to mostly, you know, I'll turn this over to Michael if he has anything to add, but I'm sure there's a lot of questions. But our second agenda item today is also about um, the payment of wages because there are, there are definitely questions around that. And that was why I felt we, we should have this meeting. It's just to discuss and to vote a little bit about some of what we have uh, been putting forward. You know, some of it we have to act in the moment um, and, and try to keep people whole in this time of crisis. But I feel that it was um, prudent to meet to discuss our plans with the payment of wages, uh, certainly during this first two week and now a three week closure. So, Michael, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. You may need to unmute yourself also. He's a man of few words. Mute is at the bottom of the screen, Michael, if you um, you could also do, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to, to Scott. Michael and I are both here, so if he needs me, he knows he can just pop over here. Okay, thank you. So, so to the committee, are there any questions that anybody else has? And why don't we, just to, for the purpose of ease, why don't we just go around, you know, in order? And Chris, I can see your photo, so I'll sort of start with you. Do you have any questions, any comments on on anything? Yeah, so... um. Thank you, first of all, and thank you, Patrick, for uh, the tireless work you guys have been putting in. Uh, I know firsthand just how much this has thrown everyone off kilter. Um, but really, my one question is, what are the efforts that are being done uh, by uh, the teachers and the administrators to try and keep some semblance of learning going on at home during this time? And what are the expectations for, um, for, for how kids can kind of keep up? Great, Chris. Great question. So th this is um, clearly stated here, but it's also very confusing. And so I appreciate the question. I'm getting this from a lot of folks. Um, and um, I, I will say that, you know, the key here is that these are non-school days. Okay. And so first of all, I have to differentiate, you know, what's happening in other districts versus what's happening here. I, I know that what we're doing here is clear and we can't really compare ourselves to other districts. We can't really compare ourselves to other states. What's being very clear from the state is that these need to be non-school days and there needs, so this is not, we can't just switch to online like some colleges and universities are doing. And there are many reasons for that. Most of them have to deal with equity and that's equity among our own students, making sure that all students are able to receive services. Any student that doesn't have access to the internet or access to services that can't be provided virtually would be being denied a free access to their public education. So we have to be very careful about calling this a school day and saying learning is going to happen, everyone's going to be online at a certain time, assignments are going to be made, teachers are going to be given feedback and grading. Um, so we have to be very careful of, of violating um, anyone's access to a free education. There are certain students you could imagine that just can't do that based on their specialized programs. And so it, we can't we can't do it for some and not for all. OK, and then across the state, there's an issue of equity that we can't do this in some districts might be wealthy and ready to do this. And they paid a lot of money for some real robust system. And in other places, they can't do it at all. I'd say North Reading is somewhere in the middle. We have a lot of tools and a lot of technology, but we don't have a, a, a complete learning management system that we can switch to overnight. So I would not say and I've spoken to some parents about this. This is not a technology issue. We do have Chromebooks. We do have online learning, um, but we can't just switch and just pretend like it's a regular school day. So what we're doing, which is what the entire state has agreed to do, and you know we've had many meetings with superintendents in a lot of districts. Some some of those districts, I will say, are the ones that, I, you know, I'm reading some different messages coming from teachers in those districts. So I, I've repeated to superintendents, hey, you might want to go look at your blah 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 to make sure we're all on the same page here. Okay. Um, the other thing that, that's important is our relationship with our unions. We have an excellent relationship with our unions here. There are some. Uh, some districts that I've heard there are more challenges than what we've had here. Peter Kane, our teachers and REA president, has been wonderful. He and I have been speaking multiple times a day, uh, you know, bouncing ideas off one another, making sure we're all on the same page with our expectations. So our teachers are working. They are checking in. We've set some sort of minimum expectations for folks because, honestly, remember, all these folks are home. 
many of them with their own children and their own or their own parents and dealing with things as well. Um, and, and that's sort of always our first priority. You know, myself and Michael included, we've got families. And if, you know, if someone in our family is sick, I mean, those are our priorities. I think we all know that. Um, but at the same time, I think our teachers are really coming together. If you can see what they're doing, uh, I'm, I'm looking at emails, I'm looking at social media, Twitter, things like that. The lessons that teachers are putting out there for students to access are fantastic. So Dr. Downs and, and, our entire team, uh, Mr. Clean, Ms. O'Connell, um, everybody on our administrative team has put together some incredible resources. And that there's more and more coming every day. Um, you know, I'm tweeting some things out. People are putting things out there. We're trying to put them out in, in somewhat of an organized fashion. But right now, it's just been sort of a, a sharing of resources. Um, so there's a lot out there to do. So the idea is that folks that are at home can work with their students. We highly recommend having some kind of structured day. These, you know, Parents shouldn't view this as a snow day where they're just having play dates or playing. You know, we should think of it as a, a, a learning day where folks can go in and access some of these resources. Even if it's as simple as I, I, I put out, you know, 150 educational programs on Netflix. Again, most of these have been vetted. I'm, I'm using some reputable sources to forward. We're doing the best we can. WGBH is putting out um, lots of quality programming, and also they're, put, they're, they're actually giving – time on the air for the Department of Education to have some Massachusetts teachers and educators come out and actually um, do some learning there. So for folks without internet access, you can um, you can watch uh, WGBH over the airwaves. There are, if you don't have internet access, there's, there's already low program, $10 a month programs, but there, I believe all the major providers are providing uh, free access to the internet. And I think we've shared that out. On our, on our website and on our frequently asked questions. You know, so we want to make sure everyone has some access to those, um, to those materials that are out there. So again, the, the basic way that it's going to work is students can engage, teachers are going to put things out, recommendations. What the state's saying is, you know, think of it like a summer reading list. Think of it like a math packet that's sent over the summer. Okay, so you're, there's information out there. We're highly recommending that students engage with those resources and materials, and they're completing it on their own pace, but there's not an expectation of graded assignments. The kids, when they come back, just like with summer reading, there's an expectation that they will have completed some work, but we understand the students might be in different places, and, and they're not going to be um, graded as such as this is not a school day. So that there is some confusion there. That there is some challenges there. It, you know, we're it's sort of a whole new world. We're going to be dealing with this in a different way when we come back. Um, but the idea is that there's a million things out there to do. There's virtual tours of museums. There's science lessons. There's uh, We have free programs like Zern for math that students can go in. And many of them are accustomed to doing this in a hybrid fashion in their classroom, so they're going to engage with that in that way. Teachers are using Google Classroom, but not as an interactive online learning tool where there's a, you know, but a teacher may record a video for, for students to, to learn from. They may make a, a video of them reading a book to a class that students can listen to during the day. They may demonstrate how to do some math problems. They may put some content out there that students can engage with. Teachers are, we've agreed at minimum, they are checking in at the beginning of the week and pushing some content out and then checking in with students throughout the week as well. Okay. On the special education side, we have also additionally asked um, our teachers to contact on their caseload just to check in. And we think that that's wonderful. So they, uh, they have some very specific guidelines that Cynthia Conant's worked on and developed that she's given out to all our special education uh, folks about exactly how that looks. Since they're calling from home phones, we've given some uh, guidance about how to you know, keep your number private when you're engaging and how to use your school email address when engaging. But those are check-ins to see how students are doing, to check in with parents, and to check in with, with uh, those on their caseloads. Um, you know, and then, you know, in, in addition to that, we've also just got some other great things that are happening that are more the social education. Our student council, Amy Sandler and her students, um, and we've also got some volunteers in the community that are coming together to do some social interaction virtually, which I think is just a fantastic idea. Those things are taking shape, but that might look like, you know, a high school buddy reaching out to some um, students in the middle school, for example, and just having some social time as a nice break in the middle of the day, which I just thought was a fantastic idea. Everybody wants to help. We can't necessarily be person to person physically close together, but I think that ability to uh, make those kind of connections, I thought that was just a wonderful idea. So you're going to hear more about those ideas coming soon as well. So kind of a long answer there, Chris, but I hope that I covered some of what you're looking for. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I'm all set. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Diana, do you have any comments or questions? I only have a comment, um, Patrick and the rest of the administration. I just want to thank you both from a school committee perspective, but then also the parent experience has been um, really streamlined. I feel like it was a, a great balance of communication. Um, and I think that I've heard that in the community as well. So I just wanted to thank you for the great job that you guys are doing through all of this. Thank you, Diana. Great. All right. Are you guys able to hear me now? This is Mike, Michael Conley. We are, Michael. Great. I just, so I had a little microphone difficulties earlier, but I just wanted to echo Dr. Daly's comments and that, um, you know, the, the custodial staff is, is certainly, you know, stepping up and then doing a great job with, with the cleaning over these last, you know, several, several days. And certainly um, glad to see the, the efforts and the progress made on, on that front. And, um, and at the same time, the, the food service staff is also um, preparing and, you know, they're partnered with the food service pantry in North Reading this week. So I certainly appreciate the assistance by Michael Gilberto to provide some um, steps there this week to, to families. And then starting on Monday, we'll be having a um, grab and go, uh, you know, delivery and pick up. Um, you know, mail program started. So there's, there's a lot of good work being done by, by some staff that's working hard. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this is Imbriano. Do you have any comments? We will move on to Rich. Rich, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. A uh, couple, couple things. One is I just want to commend not only Dr. Daly, but the superintendents around the state uh, towards the end of last week for uh, really taking the lead on school closures. Um, I think they were a little bit ahead of the state guidance in, in that area, and I think they uh, were very quickly proven to be making the right decision. So I uh, appreciate that they uh, came together. Um, uh, the fact, that, uh, Patrick, that you were able to, that uh, the Maribac Valley uh, Superintendents Association was able to come together and act as a group, I thought was really powerful. And uh, uh, I, you know, I congratulate you on on, those, on that effort. It, 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 I think, it, like I say, I think the superintendents were a little bit ahead and leading the way in, in this area. So uh, I appreciate that. And also, um, I'm really glad to see um, some of the things that we're doing. I, what, what's happening with the food service program and 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 the food pantry, I think, is wonderful. I hope. Uh, I hope. Uh, everyone in the town becomes aware of it and is able to take advantage of it. It's uh, um, certainly one of those areas that one immediately starts to think about uh, when these things happen. It's, it's those kids who rely on on school breakfast and lunch lunches um, for a, a significant portion of their nutrition. So uh, I appreciate those efforts as well. I don't have any questions though, so thanks. Thank you. I see Janine now. Janine, do you have any comments? Scott, can I just, do you mind if I just address that? So uh, I just want to thank um, you, Rich, for those comments. I think that I just want to clarify too. At this time, we're saying the free and reduced lunch is for those, um, the, the free breakfast are for those that are eligible for free and reduced lunch, and that's what we've sent out. But I, I want to extend, you know, if, if anyone is having an extreme um, hardship or need and, and, and needs to benefit from those, please contact Anna. Um, the governess, her information is here. I have it up on the screen as well. Um, you know, it, I, I want to make sure that any, you know, no student is going hungry, um, but certainly the free and reduced lunch students that are eligible would, would come first. We don't, we're not receiving um, some of the reimbursements that they are in other districts, and that's why it may look a little, the program may look a little different than it does in other districts. But I want to, I just want to say here that we will find a way to help you if your if your children are hungry, no matter what's going on. Um, I want to thank, you know, also our, our town working with, you know, you know, in my in my long career here as superintendent, I haven't had so many opportunities to work with uh, with, with our town, and, you know. And, and Michael Gilberto and I were talking about an opportunity for me to go around and shake people's hands to introduce myself. And I guess this is uh, 
quite the way to get to meet everyone. But, you know, from, from our health department, Bob Bracey and Pam Vaps to, to Michael Gilberto, who I've been in constant contact with, um, and, and our chiefs. And, and, you know, we really came together. I, I want to say the whole town was so proactive. I felt that North Reading was really well positioned. We started meeting um, with, with some pr- preventative meetings about two and a half weeks ago. We had an emergency meeting on, I believe, Tuesday of last week. And, you know, and then things just really amped up on Thursday. I agree. We came together. Friday was a, a challenging day um, as we got, you know, information from the commissioner and the governor that we felt just wasn't going far enough. And we quickly shifted to roundtables with Merrimack Valley Group and every roundtable group to make this sort of unified decision. It was something that I had sort of called for with our superintendents about a week earlier and said we need a unified response because once districts start going rogue, it starts setting precedent. And that's sort of what was happening over the week. And we really came together on Friday and said, we need to, you know, take the information we have from uh, the best information we've gathered from around the state and come to a unified decision. And I think that was a great decision. And as you said, um, over the weekend, then the governor kind of matches what we did. And, and so we, we're going to continue to watch that moving forward. So thank you. I just wanted to get those two uh, responses out to Rich. Thanks, Scott. Of course. Janine, can you unmute yourself now to talk? I figured it out. Yay. (laughs) Um, I just wanted to echo what everyone else is saying. What a whirlwind. I had mentioned something to Patrick the other day about welcome to your superintendency. And he said, hey, you know, baptism by fire. So I think everyone's doing an incredible job on this. And I think through perseverance, we'll probably get through it unscathed, hopefully. Um, And, you know, just thank you, Patrick, and the administration and the town side and everything for everything that is going on. So, okay. thank you, Janine. And and for my comments, obviously, same thing. I want to just thank everybody for the work they put in. I think Patrick, you've been really good about keeping me up to date. Um, I appreciate that you're not working on your own. You're working with other people. You're working with the town. You're working with you know the school, other school districts, and you know, that's really it's really important to speak with one voice in times of crisis. And so I think. Um, you know, I mean, nobody knows what the outcome of this is going to be, but all we can do is take it day by day. And I think you've tried to instill that message throughout, which is good. Um, and my only question is when when you can't have time on learning, I know that at the elementary level, there was three days of parent-teacher conferences that were scheduled. Um, one of those occurred, the other two did not. And I've had a couple of people ask me, are those sorts of things that could happen on non-school days or can they not happen on non-school days? So, Scott, that's something uh, that we've discussed at the administrative level and also with the teachers union. I think they certainly those are the things that could happen. I think we just have to talk about what it looks like and how they would happen. Um, there's pros and cons to to doing it now. I think we're already partway through the co- the conferences. We had we had uh, one of three days of elementary conferences that's already happened. Teachers were ready to give those conferences that day. So I think they're well positioned. I think high school is ready for them the next week. Um, so Peter Kane has been great working with me to pro- provide some, uh, guidance on how this could look sort of a scenario A, B with some guidance and, and, uh, expectations for folks. And so I, I think, um, there's two ways to look at it. There's one way is like we proceed and we sort of have this, uh, this procedure to do. The other way is do we hit the pause button and kind of wait and see where, what's going next. And so I, I'm also talking to other superintendents to see where they are and where they're positioned um, and what to do. One thing that we certainly want to avoid and we want to give careful guidance to the teachers is we want the conversation to be about um, the students' progress up until March 12th and where the students are and, and not have the focus of the conversation be about what's next, why are we doing this, when are we going back to school. I mean, honestly, questions teachers aren't equipped to handle right now. Um, because we're still trying to figure this out and wait it. So I think we have to give some scripted responses and, and communicate that out to parents that these will be the responses to those questions because I, I'm, I'm a little wary of uh, misinformation getting out there. If one teacher says this and then it spreads, oh, this teacher said that, you know, the teachers honestly don't know um, any more about when we're coming back than, than, than I do, which is right now it's April 7th. But we don't know. And, and anything that's speculation, I'd be concerned with that getting out. Now, that said, I, as I mentioned earlier, teachers are reaching out anyway. So we already have communication happening. So I don't think it would be that different between what we're doing now. But 
you are putting yourself in a certain situation and um, we have to, we have to think about that. I also don't want it to raise any more alarm. If a parent right now thinks their student's doing fine and they have a conversation and they realize maybe they're, they need more help. And now they're more concerned because we're not in school. So I don't want to tighten anyone's anxiety by doing this. Right. So I think, I think we can achieve that. I've heard some, uh, our, our administrative council is somewhat split at the moment about whether it's a good idea to hit pause or whether to continue. In some ways it's like, let's wait. In other ways it's, Hey, this is all fresh in our minds. Let's get these, uh, through and get them completed. So, my, my thought, Scott, is that we will continue to have this conversation this week and have some information to you uh, soon with a response. Uh, it, it might not be formally at a meeting, but it might be through email that this is our plan to continue. I think we will have some kind of conference closure. That's, if I had to guess today, I, I feel like we're, we're coming to consensus about what that could look like. Thank you. Yeah, and and just to kind of give my my thoughts on this, it's it's twofold. Number one is, you know, with conferences you have to go to half days, yep. and so my worry is if we do come back, about you know having a close to have conferences again would be it just I'd love to avoid that if possible. And then the second my second concern is just I mean I was able to get my the parent teacher conferences in, and it was good to hear where my kids are you know, excelling in where they need a little bit of extra help. And so, you know, when we do have three weeks, it's nice to say, like, oh, well, you know, really focus on reading with, with this child. And so, again, for me as a parent, it was useful to know that and hear some of the feedback about where they were at on March 12th. And, you know, now when we're here, we can, you know, if we're, if we're doing optional resources, you know, maybe focus on reading or you know, reading. So that was just my thought. But I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. And, that's your guidance on these issues. So moving on, so one of the main reasons we're here today is to, to discuss payment of wages. So, go ahead, Matt. Got it. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, we're, one thing that we're going to want to get out there is that our, you know, optional nature and that, you know, it, if there's really no pressing need or concern, we don't know that that conference needs to happen. So, it, you know, on both sides, we'll look through, you know, those pieces. Um, so I think we have some information there. Be before we move to wages, I, can I just clarify about the school day and the vacation, just to clarify that? Of course. So, I, you know, I posted this, and, and what I'm doing with the frequently asked questions is, as we add new information, we'll throw it up there in yellow. So as you're sc scanning through, if you see something highlighted in yellow, that might be something new that wasn't there yesterday. So one thing that we're uh, putting out there, and this is a bit confusing, but we, we're required to attend um, for 185 days this year because the governor, I'm sorry, the commissioner has extended um, backwards. So usually you don't have to make up any days after April 1st. He moved that back to March 15th. So until we hit our regularly scheduled um 185th day, which is June 24, that is the last mandated day that we need to be in school. We do not need to make up the days uh, for time on learning purposes that occur from March 15th until the end of the school year, as long as we hit our 185. So with the number of snow days that were already called, I believe there were two, um, and I, I remember feeling good that I didn't have to call a snow day. <laughs> so there were no snow days. March 13th was one day. Monday was day three. Four, and then Tuesday would have been day five, I believe. We are now at our, we've used our five days. The rest of the days of this closure through April 7th, we do not need to make up. Now that said, both sides, teachers, students, everyone, you know, we need to be thinking about what it actually will look like when we return and whether we need some extra days. So some other day beyond the table for actual uh, time on learning that we feel is to get kids ready to give final exams, to have ceremonies like graduation, um, things like that might be in, in, in flux to the end of the year. The same goes for April vacation. I mean, we need to be thinking, at least in the back of our minds, I think a lot of us may have canceled or changed our travel plans anyway, but if we were to return on April 7th, it'd make a lot of sense to come back for a week and a half and then take a, a five-day vacation again. And okay, the marathons canceled, those things are moved. So if we were to be in school, we need to be thinking 
talked about uh, a little bit differently. No decisions made on that, but I just wanted to make sure that is um, clear that that's on the table for making up some lost time. So um, I wanted to just put that out there. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. If yes, so oh, Chris, uh, Chris, Mr. Buckley, can I ask a quick question? Just, uh, <clears throat> just with introducing that idea, and, and uh, Dr. Daly, I think we all heard you that things are very much in a state of flux now. Um, that said, there are some families that, that might not have adjusted. There are ideas to make the update in which decision will be made. Or any of those bigger things like changing into a uh, Not. I, I hear what you're saying, and I just think right now we're just trying to get through this week, and then I think as we get closer to 7th, either no whether it's being extended at that time. I think as the closer we get to April 7th, we should be talking about what April vacation lo looks like. Um, and, I, and I think we're going to continue to be flexible with, with that. So if someone's really stressed out about missing days because of existing vacation on April vacation and we're back, I mean, we'll figure that out. But we, we want to provide as many opportunities for school days as students this year. I mean, so with, with this large amount of thing. We want to make sure that students have enough time in school to meet grade level expectations. And, and you know, we, we might be having a very different conversation in three weeks, but right now that's, that's where we're at. So we want to be thinking about, you know, getting kids by June 30th as much time in school as possible to get what they need to learn for that year. So if you folks want me to have a deadline in mind, I can definitely consider, you know, something like that might work. Sorry, but it's something for us to think about and maybe chat about. Yeah, we have, we have a school committee meeting coming up. We can we can think we can continue to reevaluate at that point in time, I guess. But I I do think that's a good point, Chris. Where especially if people have to cancel by a certain date to get money back, if they haven't canceled yet, and so but. Who knows what's going to happen? I think I think everyone's worried that it could be longer than three weeks, and so you know we'll just take That's it week by week right now. No, yeah. and that's why I put it out there now. If you're on the fence, it might be a good idea to think about. We may still be in a, you know, we may still we may have to extend the closure to cover those weeks, and we may also be coming back and then not going on vacation. I want people to be thinking of that now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, everyone's worried about not talking to people. I kind of like never leaving my house and talking to people anymore, so. Okay, so moving on. So payment of wages, and I don't know if Patrick or Michael would like to present on the issue and the issue and, and what, what, what authority you're looking for from us. Michael, would you like to address it, or should I? Okay, can you can you everyone hear me? Well, I'll just I'll begin by saying that. Uh, yes, you can hear me, Michael. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So I think what I think what the, we are looking to get accomplished here, as um, is we. Are looking for approval to move forward during the school closure period and pay um, our both salary, salary and hourly employees their their wages um, essentially as if we were sort of operating at the school district as as normally um, you know based on either their their standardized hours uh, that they would be working um, from during the school closure period. Uh, so I think that's the first, um, you know, item that we're looking for approval, and um, you know that's that, that's the, certainly the, the the first item on the agenda there. So if I can just clarify, Michael, I want to clarify a couple things. First and foremost, two votes. Maybe there should be two. Well, I guess it can be all together, but it's going to be on 
just the approval wages through April 7th right now, because that's all we're closed right now, correct? Okay. And then, and, and while, I, I mean, I, was say, correct. I, okay, I will say right now, while I am in right. favor of that, I do think it merits getting a little bit more information as well about what the contractual obligations are, and in particular with the hourly employees, because I know I've asked you guys these questions, um, what the cost is, and so just so everybody understands when, again, I'm in, I'm in favor of doing this, but I do want to make sure that we we are clear that this is, especially with hourly employees, I don't think this is something that has to happen. And, you know, our decision also puts some pressure on the town because there's other people in town that also are, you know, being paid by tax dollars that are hourly as well. And I think the hourly employees, it's about $85,000 per week that we're talking about. And so I just want to see if other people have comments or thoughts, thought process on, on looking through this. Uh, Scott, can I just so... Uh, if I could, Michael, just, you know, just we made the decision um, early on that people needed to be kept whole as we were trying to scramble to figure out what was going on. So what we did put out in our frequently asked questions and what we communicated out was that we were going to keep people whole, including hourly employees. This was, it was basically consensus throughout the state that during this time. Um, and again, I think it's definitely that period of two weeks, which I'm now asking, as Scott mentioned, to extend to the full three weeks of the close. If this were to continue, I think that that's what we need to, to, to discuss. I do want to clarify, because the question's coming in quite a bit, this time position. So stipends, coaching positions, those kind of positions, we're not necessarily uh, voting today to keep those whole because some of those positions uh, are, are dependent on revenue that also might be um, not happening. For example, we're not selling lunches, and so that is an impact on money that's not coming in to the district. So, you know, I, I understand that people depend on those, those stipends and those as a part of their salary. We're addressing keeping people whole. We're talking about full-time positions. I think that's an important clarification to make. Mike, Michael, yeah, as well. Yeah, that's, that's Michael. correct. I appreciate Dr. Daly's comments. Um, that is what we're looking to do, and as you can read through the FAQ, that that is a um, you know something we we, we put out there um, you know kind of early on during during this closure period. That 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 is a commitment that that we would make. You know, you know we're really looking to um, you know not want to create any sort of undue kind of economic you know hardship during this certainly time of crisis but there's certainly a lot of a lot of factors to to, to consider um in doing that but we are looking at their kind of regular um you know standard hours in, in wages you know, anything as dr daly noted um beyond the, the regular base wages um is something that we're we're not uh, talking about um with, with this with this vote right now Okay, so committee members, any comments or, or thoughts? It'll go the same order, Chris. Uh, sure, just um, just on that topic, and, and this might have gotten answered, but uh, I was having trouble with, with some of the audio here. Uh, it sounds like this applies at an instance to full-time employees. Uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly who is and who isn't a part-time employee. I understood coaches and site benefit positions aren't included in this, but uh, all clerical staff, custodial staff, lunch staff, and say any half-time faculty members, they are included in, in this. They would be getting paid. Michael, do you want to answer? Um, yes. So, so Chris, that what we are essentially uh, talking about here would be, you know, our, our salary wage folks as essentially the, the administrators and the teachers. Um, and we're certainly asking those folks to continue to do some work during the period of, of closure. Um, and the, the hourly wages folks that we're really speaking about is, 
is really essentially how what what you just kind of laid out. Um, you see the certainly the, the secretary of staff, the the, the prior professional custodian, um, you know, special education bus drivers that we employ, as well as the the food service workers, and then the business office staff, which is accounts payable and payroll accountant. They are still working and they are working remotely and processing payroll and keeping accounts payable lines going during this during this time period. Okay, thank you. And then uh, one, one last question on uh, building subs. Would they be included as well? So the, the building subs are not included. Uh, we we actually tried to get all of their time sheets through March 13th um, to payroll before our payroll folks um, you know left. So anyone that had worked through March 13th during the time we were open or through March 12th, would be compensated on the during this two week period as we normally would, but there's no daily or building subs coming in now, so so those those folks will not get paid. Um, if there's a situation where there was a long term substitute that was contracted to come in for a long period of time, um, either a year, six months, or a a teacher that was on an approved leave of absence. Uh, we we are looking to to pay that pay those individuals. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Diana, do you have any questions or thoughts? Can you hear me? Am I off mute? Okay. Um, yes. No, I don't have any questions. Um, I'm absolutely in favor, but I appreciate you walking us through the details of it. Great, thank you. Janine, any comments or thoughts or questions? Just for up until the April 7th, right? Correct. Okay, and your part two would be if it goes beyond that? It's I, 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 I don't think we're going to vote on that today. Okay. But that is your part well, two. Well, no, the part two was, well, the, the two potential motions were do we have to have a separate motion for salaried versus hourly? Okay. Because I think they're different contractual things. I don't know that we have much say in that, but I think it can, right. if all we're going to do is say, let's keep everything the same, I think it can just be one motion. I was just thinking out loud about whether one or two motions were needed. Uh, well, no, because sometimes this sounds very soft and it's difficult to understand what's being said. So my apologies on that. Um, but having asked that question, um, if it goes beyond the um, April 7th, would we reevaluate? Would we? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I, I spoke to Patrick. Just go ahead, Patrick. Okay. I, I, you're you're breaking up a little bit, Patrick. Okay. I'll, I'll go. Patrick, you're breaking up a little bit, so why don't why don't I go? Am I am I coming through clearly, Janina? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. okay. So yes, I think we we talked about we could reevaluate afterwards, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we also don't know what the plans would be after April seventh. Like there could be some, for example, changing April vacation. And if we're going to then have people that are working over April vacation, there might be contractual issues that need to be addressed. There could be an extension of the school year. Um, I mean, it won't be, you know, we're saying the last stage that's required is June 24th. What if we wanted to thought there could be a couple more days? So I think beyond the three week closure, there could be some changes to the schedule going forward. And so I think that we would want to reevaluate that beforehand. So I, I think in the very beginning, the concern was people that have no weren't prepared for any of this. Um, what, what do we do? So I think right now we're only talking about the three week period, and then we can come together before that period is up if we want to talk about an extension beyond that. So if I could, there's a great many. That was my question because if. I understood what Patrick was saying, and we end up going past um, June 24th, then we're going to be liable for those salaries 
at that point in time. So that was kind of my concern that it's not extended past the, the seventh. And how does the government, um, uh, I can't think of the words. Um, yes, thank you. How does that, will we get reimbursed or can the hourly people and the salary people get reimbursed if we can't afford to pay them past June 24th type thing? You know what I'm saying? Is what we're doing today going to cause repercussions um, if the virus you know, goes away and we end up being able to have school past the 24th? So I, I know, Patrick, you were trying to say something. Do you want to jump in here? on both sides um, with all of our unions as well as the administration and management. Um, questions that will come up that will need to be bargained and discussed. So I, I would recommend doing the April 7th, but certainly needing to reevaluate. And there's also so much coming out, you say, from the, from the department, from the federal government, um, that could be game changers. So I, I, I would be wary of making any kind of decision that takes us to June 30th at this time, because I think there's a lot of things that are that are questions that will be. So this, I don't think there's any need to, to really make decisions. You know, we can, we can make our best guess, but I think to make an actual decision through the April 7th makes sense. But beyond that, I think there's a lot of variables that are still in flux. Yes, and if, could I just add to Janine's question? So I, I, as Patrick just mentioned, I think there is a lot um, that remains to be seen. Um, it's just a very, very fluid situation, um, unprecedented situation in the state. So there's certainly a lot to consider um, with, with any decisions beyond April 7th would, uh, that would certainly have potentially have an impact. Um, you know, there is a chance the state might would, would, would come in and, and provide, you know, wages in a temporary time period. But, um, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of variables to, to as Pat, Patrick just mentioned, of, of, of those decisions that we have to watch very closely over the next, you know, two, two and a half weeks. I will add, Jane, and I asked a lot. Patrick, it's Diana. Go, oh, Diana. I just wanted to ask Patrick a quick question. Do you happen to know what other neighboring communities are doing? I do. I, I would say it's it's fairly the consensus that there will be everyone held harmless through three weeks. Um, and and we're certainly, with our own staff and employees, I think there's clear consensus across the board that, that everyone is held harmless, even those hourly folks, like I said, that are paid from um, revolving accounts that money might not be coming in as, as typical. We want to hold people harmless. I know those are the first questions I got. Um, I never wanted to put anyone in a situation where they're worried about making rent or getting food on their table because they're waiting, they're living paycheck to paycheck. And we certainly are going to take care of that for three weeks. I think we have to, you know, I, we're not, we can't wait till April 6th to make a decision um, for what we're doing beyond that. But I think, you know, we still have the better part of three weeks to continue those conversations. There are, there are additional conversations that we're having daily about um, other employees that are indirectly working with the schools, such as bus drivers. Um, and, and we need to think about those positions as well. Um, and th th it's very complicated. These things are in flux every day, but there is certainly consensus among, um, you know, the entire, well, I'm on a, I'm on a list where I've been calls with all the supers in the state. And there's certainly consensus about keeping people whole for the next 30 days. Oh, I'm sorry, for the, <laughs> through April 7th. Um, and, uh, I, you know, we took the lead and put that out there to give people peace of mind because they wanted answers right away. And I appreciate, um, you know, that what, what I'm hearing is some support for that idea um, here, but I know we'll do a formal vote. So. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I'll get to you. Can I, can I, can I uh, make a couple of comments? Yeah, go ahead, Rich. And then uh, a couple of comments. First of all, about the sound. Patrick, there's one open mic. I think it might be Diana. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, mute, okay. mute that, but I think it's causing some echo. And also, uh, as I said, have you, you been in and out? And I think it might have to do with the fact that you seem to have three connections into the chat. Uh, just 
I don't know if there's anything you can do about it now, but just to let you know. Um, but anyway, that being said, regarding the issue. Yeah, I'm re I'm recording. I'm recording. The yeah, I'm I'm presenting and I'm recording, so that's why okay. I'm on. Um, so I, uh, regarding the question at hand, um, definitely um, in favor of okay. this. Uh, and also, I it, it, it seems pretty clear that any discussion of what might or might not happen after April 7th is, is way premature. I mean, I think we all, you know, know in our hearts that there's a really good chance that this will be extended, and that, you know, any plans we make now will be uh, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, at this point. So, um, I would say that, uh, you know, I think the right thing to do, and also, um, you know, it's probably a good thing to do just for you know, the, uh, the, the school community and, and making sure everyone's well taken care of. So, yeah. thank, thank you, Rich. So I have, I have a couple comments as well. Um, one clarification, <laughs> surprise. Uh, one clarification first, we're, uh, Patrick mentioned the bus drivers. I think we're gonna talk about the bus drivers later or separately. This is the motion we're talking about right now does not include paying bus drivers. The first motion we're talking about is just for North Reading public school employees. The second comment would be I had also asked some of the same questions to Michael about unemployment. I don't know much about an unemployment. Um, we don't have any legal answers really, but basically with unemployment about you would only get about fifty percent of your of your salary and I don't even though somebody's not working, we don't think that you could file for unemployment, get 50% of your wages, and then us still pay them part of the wages because that's not the way it was intended. And so, I mean, part of we would love to do that where we could save half of it if they can get through unemployment and make the argument that, you know, you're not working, it's not normal wages, and so I need to be giving this more of a benefit rather than uh, an actual hourly wage. But... I think for the next three weeks, I don't think we can make that, we're not gonna make that argument, but I, I was wondering about that as well. And the last point is just, the reality is in our budget, we have allocated money for this. So this is not at looking at a cost overrun thing. This is looking at just using the weight, the money that was set aside. Now granted it was set aside for work to be done, but again, it's not like we're drawing into reserve funds um, to pay you know normal hourly, wages that we were planning on. So any other further comments and then we can take and then maybe we can have a motion to then we can have a motion to approve as normal the salaried and hourly wages until through April seven. Why would we pay the bus drivers if the bus is under contract. I thought they took care of that, just for clarification on my side. Uh, if I could be able to speak to that a little bit, Scott. Mike, oh, well, let me ask you a question, Michael. Are we gonna are we gonna vote on that today as well? So the idea is that we don't plan to ask for a vote on that today. So uh, we want to kind of gather some more information about that, just speak to other districts, speak more with the actual company on on what the implications of, of either doing that or not doing that. Um, I will say, uh, certainly our bus company, I think other bus companies have been reaching out to school districts across the state that they're under contract with and requesting if there was a way we could work something out where at least the labor portion of the contract, yeah, you know, we, we get charged a per uh, day fee per bus that we run, which for us is about $330 a, a day per bus. Not all of that, obviously, is, is the salary of the bus driver. There's, there's fuel and there's overhead built into that rate. Um, so, so they've certainly, they, they're asking districts across the state, not just North Reading, to consider during a period of closure um, to at least pay the, the labor portion of, of that rate. So that rate would probably go down by about 50% from what I'm told. Um, Mainly because of a concern is if they were completely laid off during this time period, and the time period were were to extend, um, 
there's a chance that those bus drivers would go get other jobs. They would have to pursue other work. Um, and then at that time, you know, when we do re resume um, normal operations, normal school activity, there's a chance, given that there's such a shortage of qualified bus drivers, that we would not have the bus drivers to come back to work and, and drive our students. Um, but that, that we're not asking for um, a vote on that. That's that the argument coming from the bus company. It certainly needs further discussion and, and further um, evaluation in, in collaboration with other school districts as well. Okay. Thank you, Michael. So if I can have a motion to approve. No, I'll make a motion. Okay. Thank you, Richard. I move that we that the school committee vote to uh, support the administration plan to continue to play pay um, employees their regular uh, uh, pay through April seventh. I second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. So we have to do a roll call on this. Rich. Aye. Chris? Aye, definitely. Janine? Aye. Aye. Diana? And I'm an I as well, so that's 5 0 unanimous. So Patrick or Michael, are there, uh, are there routine matters or any minutes or anything else you want us to go through as well? Um, the only other thing that I was going to bring folks up to speed on is this is, I don't know if this was a good, a good time to address it. This is, this is more would qualify under budget update, I would think, uh, in, in business, bids and donations update is, as the committee was aware, we've had, we kind of have two, that's the two energy management, um, initiatives that we've been pursuing. Um, we, we, in, in regards to the LED lighting uh, project and proposals, we did receive two uh, requests for proposals from two very qualified firms that I think gave very, very interesting proposals that both have pros and cons, and I think they're both very qualified to do the work. So I, I was in touch with Dr. Daly, um, and we feel the best uh, method of moving forward or the next logical step was actually to move forward and create a selection committee um, of, of myself, Dr. Daly, Supervisor of Buildings and Grounds, Wayne Hardiker, who's I think the chairman of the, the school committee, you know, obviously Mr. Buckley as a member of the budget subcommittee is a logical person to sit on that selection committee. Um, Diana, who's also been involved in some of the conversation as a member of the budget subcommittee, we feel like it may be appropriate to, to kind of run those meetings through a through a through budget subcommittee type meetings, um, and we've also reached out to the town Michael Gilberto and asked him to uh, you know if, if he has anybody from the town that he would like to, to sit on the committee um, as well. We're, we're certainly more than interested in, in opening it up that way. Uh, but essentially, what we're looking to do is invite each firm in, have them make a pre presentation on four or five key criteria that we're considering that they would be provided for in advance. We would share those proposals out to the committee members in advance of the meetings. And um, I think it would be important for more people to be involved in the decision. It's a very big decision that involves financing um, uh, before we move forward. So that would, is what we felt was the logical steps. Now, we were going to have this be kind of face-to-face -face interview. That was the plan over the next two or three weeks. I, I feel like, given what's going on, if we were going to move on this over the next between now and April 7th, those would have to be more virtual meetings. Um, I think we could definitely arrange with each firm. Uh, but I did want to update uh, the committee that that's sort of our thought process on the LED lighting um, and take any comments or or thoughts on who should be on that committee and if we feel if we are we all in agreement that the budget subcommittee members make the most the most sense to start. So no. Michael Michael to begin the when you had talked to me before you had also mentioned finance committee, possibly Don Callahan. Is that another person? 
so Don, I reached out to Don Kelleher and he is very interested in taking part and he is, um, and he appreciated the, the, the invitation. So I, I do believe Don Kelleher would, would take part. Um, so. I'm sorry, Scott, would you be able to reach out on the social network and find out someone who lives in North Reading who is um, knowledgeable in the solar or the, sorry, the LED? If we want a parent, there actually is somebody, there is somebody that I know for solar, but not for LED. Um, if, if we want a parent on there, perhaps even Patrick could just send a, send a school-wide thing or a, 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 and post it and just say if there's anybody that's interested. If, you, if you're saying you want a community member, a parent. It was just a thought, but I was actually thinking solar, not LED. I just remember when um, we were doing the development of the school, um, there was a couple of parents that had come up um, that were very interested in the solar aspect of it, so that's what popped to mind. Well, j just to elaborate, because Michael talked to me the other day about this, and it, where we're at, it's, it's really those two different proposals that are very similar. And a lot of it's just going to be piercing the specifics of them to see which proposal is better. So I don't think this is much about like, should we do it or not do it? It's more just digging into the numbers and figuring out what, you know, what estimates, like for example, for reimbursement, some of the, some of the numbers had to deal with like RMLD's reimbursement under this or that and, or, or how much you would save. And so I think a lot of it is just piercing the numbers and really trying to get the proposals to apples to apples. It's a lot less about, you know, should we do it or not do it? It's more just looking at the details of it. So it's, again, I mean, if there's a community member that's interested in it, I wouldn't be opposed to it. But I think a lot of times when we ask community members, we really want more direction on what does the community want. This is, I think, more about just evaluating the two proposals as opposed to, you know, deciding if we should do it or not. So I don't know what others think about inviting community or not. I just, I, the, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I don't agree with that, Scott. I, I mean, um, I, I think to be, uh, I mean, you certainly could ask for, you know, if anybody has particular expertise in, in the general email. But I think better if we, if we know, if, 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 if we know of any expertise out there that we could uh, include them, that would be maybe the best thing. Um, but you know, I, don't, I just think an open, open invitation to community members is probably not what we need to do at this point. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I mean, I think it's good to have the town involved. I think finance committee is is very important because I think finance committee can really shed some expertise on this. Don Don in, in particular, um, you know, and I think I agree with Michael that if we have a budget subcommittee, that that's where this could lie. But I think that's probably enough for now, and because otherwise, if you get multiple community members, then we have to discuss about who should and shouldn't do it, and, and there's a little bit of a time is of the essence here because. Both, you know, both of them have put proposals in, and I don't know how long they're open for, and we need to really evaluate the two proposals and make a decision. So I would be in favor of what, what Michael suggested. I agree. Uh, Sorry. I, I, I could just say thing. one more thing about that. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with the, 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 the budget subcommittee members being on, being part of this group. I would love to see the presentations, though, so if, if, especially if they're virtual, uh, if, if that... Uh, I don't know if they if if they could be open to the public or at least open to the other committee members in a non-participatory participatory way. Um, you know, keep that in mind. Michael, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, if it's if the challenge is there's going to be a presentation and there's going to be a lot of questions as well, and so then there then it will be some discussion from the from the questions. I think we can definitely we could probably at least tape them and then perhaps share them afterwards or, or something. But I don't know. I don't know what the, I think the idea was originally to have somebody come in the room. We would all sit around. We would ask questions about it. We would probably have a meeting in advance to prepare questions after looking at the proposals. Um, I think one thing we could for certain, uh, certain do is we could probably send out the proposals to everybody. I don't think that would be anything that would be, Inappropriate because there are written proposals. Michael, do you think that yeah. sounds okay? Yeah, I think that sounds yep, like a, be quite the best 
the best idea. We, we, I had the written proposals on uh, it I received, and then what I was going to do is ask each um, firm to send me their presentation in advance. And then um, I was thinking of using the kind of the go-to webinar format, making the presentation part of um, documents that all the panelists or, or members would see. Um, and then when they're they're certainly presenting, you know, they they'll, they'll speak and kind of walk through a PowerPoint. Um, and then there's opportunity for kind of questions and back and forth, either through the chat or um, kind of in this type of format of uh, unmuting lines, um, et cetera. So, you know, bo both both firms are really really want our business. They've been they've been really aggressive. They they've really worked with RMLD to confirm numbers and, and that it's in line with their rebate program. Um, what's happening is just some firms are taking a little bit of a different approach up to the financing, a little bit of a different approach between our, our, our work with RMLD and, and how the rebates get, get made part of the, the equation. So I think getting a little bit more people involved um, is, is, is the best approach. And then I think from there, the, the, everyone will kind of understand the timeline of the project and, and, and how, it, how it would kind of play out. Um, once once an, an award is, is eventually made. So, but I think definitely sharing out the, the RFPs as well as the presentations um, makes sense. And then I, I, my thought was once the committee had a chance to deliberate the selection committees, there would be a brief, there would be a presentation by that selection committee to the, to the full school committee at a public, at a public meeting. And, and we do have a school committee meeting on Monday as well, and so I suspect that nothing's going to happen before Monday. So we could probably put it on the agenda, share materials, and you know have a brief follow-up discussion on specific questions that the committee has. You know, so maybe we could get your thoughts to bring to the to the presentation. So if we possibly can put that on for the Monday meeting, we can then you know share out the proposals there and, and get some initial feedback. Okay. I don't think we need a motion on that, but I appreciate the update and the, the, some, some of the work that the budget subcommittee will do. Um, there was one, I just wanted to provide an update on the solar as well um, at the same time. So there'll be obviously have two of these two pretty massive projects going on. Solar was due to um, be released on this past Monday, the 16th. So we had advertised last week. Um, and the RFP was due to go to bidders on, on Monday. Um, so given certainly the school closure and what's happening, um, I have delayed that, that RFP because there was, was going to need to be uh, pre-conference bid meetings, uh, site visits, site walkthroughs by many vendors uh, between now and March uh, 27th. So it just didn't seem like given that we're, what, what we're dealing with, obviously that it made sense to move forward. All of the bidders that were interested that saw the initial advertisement fully understand that. So we have kind of putting that on hold or delaying it, at least at this point until the first, until after April 7th. I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. Okay, thank you, Michael. So are there any more, is there any more routine matters or information, you know, subcommittee update, administrative report. And I think we can keep the subcommittee for, we can pass over subcommittee until Monday. Um, anything else in the administrative report or correspondence, Patrick? Do we lose Patrick? Patrick, you're on mute still. We go to the assistant superintendent for backup. Michael, anything else? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't believe there was anything else um, that Patrick certainly wanted to cover today. I think it was it was really certainly the, the update on the COVID-19, our action on the wages, and uh, again, providing the updates on those two projects and, and the impact on those. Um, so, yeah, I believe that's where we stand at this point. It looks like Patrick is yeah. here. My, I mean, I'm just having a RAM issue with my computer, so it's, it's, it's 
just getting back from recording and all this stuff at once. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to point out that, as noted in the minutes, that there is um, there is no uh, subcommittee meetings and everything have been canceled at this point, and, and a lot of those uh, pieces are not there. And you know, I, I do want to ask a question, Scott, about the next meeting because um, I do need to get that posted. So I, I'm assuming we will also do virtual. I felt this worked fairly well. Um, and so we would do a virtual meeting. Will we keep it at the scheduled time of uh, of 6.30 p.m. on Monday? Yeah, I'd be in favor of that. Yeah, I see a lot of nods, so. Okay, so it'll be a virtual meeting set up the same way, provided that all goes well with what we did here. I think it will. Um, I, I think we're going to be able to get a uh, draft of the, the minutes. Um, I believe Amandel is is helping take those uh, minutes. We're going to get that up soon, and then we'll have something together. And I would put out a new posting with uh, a different hangout option for call-in that I'll then circulate to, to, to today. Great. Thank you very much. So, so if that concludes our business, um, maybe Rich can I have a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Janine, you want to second? Chris? Second. Move whoever. <laughs> Okay. It works. All those in favor. Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Janine. Aye. Diana. Aye. And I am an aye as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Great job, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, guys.